Hey, you guys. Welcome to The Other People Show. I'm Brad Listy. I am in Los Angeles. Happy holidays. It is Christmas Eve, once again, if you can believe it. And I'm going to be doing, today and over the coming days, some special episodes, some year-in-review stuff, some best of 2023 stuff, if that's a way of putting it, just to kind of sum things up. Take a look back. Celebrate a little bit what has been accomplished here on The Other People Show in 2023. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done that yet. Wherever you listen to shows, hit the subscribe button. It's free. And follow the show on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. Subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. It's free over at bradlisty.substack.com. And if you're in the holiday spirit, join the Patreon community at patreon.com slash other PPL pod. Help keep this show going into the future. So 2023 is now coming to a close. And I kind of feel like this has been the best year ever for the show. In the sense that I made, if my calculations are correct, 134 episodes this year. And I feel like from a production value standpoint, from a host who sort of knows what he's doing standpoint from a sheer volume standpoint. I feel like I'm proud of what happened here. It's a good year for the show. And there were a lot of listeners. The audience for the Other People podcast grew significantly this year. And I'm deeply appreciative of that. So thank you very much to everybody out there who listens on a regular basis. Thank you in particular to the people who support this show, either by joining the Other People Patreon or joining the Other People Book Club or subscribing, being a paid subscriber to my newsletter or getting Other People t-shirts and sweatshirts. All of that stuff really matters because it shows me that you appreciate the work that I do. And I do quite a bit of work on this show, which I love to do. And that kind of support helps me keep doing this work. So Huge thanks to everybody. Huge thanks to all of my guests this year. People who gave their time and energy to talking with me for this show and talking to you guys, my audience, for this show. I obviously could not do it without my guests. And along those lines, I want to say that I have in the past been a little bit reticent to do a best of episode or to rank things because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I've also been reticent about sharing my favorite books of the year because I feel like I know so many writers and if I don't pick somebody's book, they're going to be heartbroken or feel like I've, you know, done something hurtful. But this year I'm just going to do it and I'm just going to count on people to be adults about this. I'm not making a value judgment (laughs) on anybody or their work. I'm just sharing episodes that got a lot of downloads And I'm going to share on New Year's Eve my favorite reads of the year, the books that just spoke to me most powerfully. I'm allowed that, right? Everybody has that experience, and I think it's worth talking about. So the the next question is how to do it. How am I going to handle all of this? And I think the best way to go about it is to do it in parts. So today, I am going to share with you the top five craft work episodes of the year. And for those of you who might be newer to the other people show this year marked the advent of a new series on the podcast called craft work and craft work episodes are about a specific element of the craft of writing or the business of publishing. So they're a little bit more instructive in their bearing, a little bit more nuts and bolts, a little bit more educational, and they have been very popular with listeners. So today I'm going to share the top five craft work episodes of the year, after which I will begin a countdown of the top 15 author interviews, if that makes sense. So it's just a, it's a matter of numbers. There were only so many craft work episodes. There were many more author interviews. So it makes sense to do the top five craft work and the top 15 author interviews. So I'll do the top five craft work today, and then I will begin with the top 15 author interviews. We're going to cover 
15 through 11 in today's episode. And then tomorrow is Christmas Day. There will be no episode. Enjoy your holiday if you celebrate or enjoy your Chinese food if you don't. And then the plan is to come back on the 26th and do the numbers 10 through 6 in terms of the most downloaded or top 15 author interviews. And then on Wednesday, the 27th, we'll do the top five author interviews of 2023. So it's going to be spread out over three episodes. I hope that's clear. And then, as I mentioned earlier, on New Year's Eve, I'm going to do a special episode where I share my favorite books of 2023. That is the plan. I'm hoping it all comes to fruition. So a quick reminder before we get going that all episodes of this podcast are available in the feed. So as I break down these episodes and share clips from some of the most downloaded episodes of 2023, please know that if you like the clip or you're interested and you haven't heard the full episode yet, you can listen to all of these episodes. They are in the feed. Just uh, go to wherever you listen to podcasts, find the other people show and scroll or search. You'll find it. All right. So here we go. We're going to start today with the top five craft work episodes of 2023. Again, this is a new series launched this year. Conversations about the craft of writing or the business of publishing. And at number five, we have an episode called how the horror genre works. And my guest here was author and story expert John Truby. His latest book is called The Anatomy of Genres, How Story Forms Explain the Way the World Works. It's available from Picador. John Truby is the founder and director of Truby's Writer Studio, and over the past 30 years, he has taught more than 50,000 students worldwide including novelists, screenwriters, and TV writers, who together have generated more than 15 billion, with a B, dollars at the box office. So here I am, back in May, talking with John Truby about how the horror genre works. There are, I think, you know, we're going to be talking about horror today, and I think whether it's horror or it's any other genre, there are certain tropes that, people come to expect and are conditioned to expect from having seen a ton of horror movies or read a bunch of horror fiction. And I think what you're talking about when it comes to theme gets to this next point, which has to do with structure. It's not enough, you argue in your book, to simply play on the tropes of a genre well. You have to do more than that in order for the story to be effective. Well, and this word trope is a very deadly term. It's the term that everybody throws around and they, and you're absolutely right. There are these different tropes in each one of the genres. The problem with the concept of trope is that it is an individual story beat. And the big mistake that so many writers make when they're writing genre stories is they think I'll just grab a few tropes, some from my genre, maybe some from others put them together, and I've got a great story. Absolutely wrong. Because the difference between trope and genre is that trope is an individual story beat. Genre is a sequence of story beats. It is the sequence of the story beats that works on the audience. Okay, that was John Truby talking with me about how the horror genre works. It is the fifth most downloaded craft work episode of 2023. Next up, number four, an episode called How to Write a Book Proposal, my conversation with Courtney Mom. Courtney is a writing coach. She is the executive director of a nonprofit learning collaborative called The Cabins. She's an educator. She's also the author of five books, including a publishing guide called Before and After the Book Deal. Vanity Fair named it one of the 10 best books for writers. She also published recently a memoir called The Year of the Horses. 
So, number four, how to write a book proposal. Here I am talking with Courtney Mom back in February of 2023. Like, what, what's in a book proposal? You've got like the sample chapter and then like the summary and then a marketing plan, right? Like that's what's in it? Again, are there hard and fast rules? Uh, not exactly, but there there is a standard approach to writing proposals. And it's it's one that I teach. And I think there's six components that you have to have, you must have. One is a table of contents. The readability and nav navigability, is that a word? <laughs> the ability to navigate your proposal fluidly is super important. People always forget to imagine the person receiving this, right? You have to imagine people that are just like us, totally overwhelmed. You know, inbox has 1400 new messages. The laundry was forgotten. It's wet and molding, right? For God's sake, include a table of contents so they, they understand how they're getting from point A to B. And if the wind blows and your papers are moved all over the place, oh, and please insert page numbers. Um, they, they know where they are, right? Okay, that was Courtney Mom in at number four i sort of feel like a dj like uh doing this countdown in at number four courtney mom with how to write a book proposal great talk with her about something that a lot of writers in particular writers of nonfiction, have to deal with so that was number four and now on to number three an episode called How the Best Seller Lists Work, a conversation with literary agent Carly Waters. Carly is a senior vice president and senior literary agent at PS Literary. She is in the realm of literary agents, one of the more online literary agents that I've ever been witness to. <laughs> She's very good online. She is also the co-host of a podcast called the shit no one tells you about writing, which is itself a very valuable resource. So here I am back in May talking with Carly Waters about a very opaque subject matter, how the bestseller lists actually work. The, the question that I'm working towards is just whether or not you, you know, having worked as an agent for all of these years and observed these market forces and these lists, if you have a sense of how it happens. Yeah, it's so interesting because there's a couple of things. Early on, there's a couple of signs or signals that potentially a book might get a tidal wave type of approach um, in terms of what that might look like. So number one being the size of the advance or how actively the publisher pursued it in order to buy it. If they spend a lot of money, they're going to then invest a lot, obviously, to recoup that. Or there's like the sleeper hits, right? So there's, you know, there's a couple of things, um, but they are paying attention to these little like sleeper hits, if you want to call it, right? Like books, maybe they didn't spend half a million dollars on, but they're like, hey, this is picking up a lot of steam. Pre-orders are picking up, you know, different outlets are talking about it. They're getting a bunch of, five, you know, um, like five-star reviews or starred reviews, you know, in some of the trades. They're, they're really, they're seeing a lot of momentum and they will, you know, have that tidal wave type of approach where we're going to double down on this, right? We're, we're trying to pay attention and, and notice that this is happening. Or there's the, we spent a lot of money on this book. Therefore, we need a big marketing campaign to recoup the investment that we spent on this. And we're going to, we're going to watch, we're going to see this through. All right, there we have it. Carly Waters and I in conversation talking about how the best seller lists actually work. In at number three, the number three most downloaded craft work episode of 2023. <laughs> Which then, of course, brings us to number two, an episode called Why Publishing is Broken. A very cheery subject, something to meditate on over the holidays. My guest was Kathleen Schmidt, a longtime publishing industry veteran with a ton of experience in a variety of roles, including as a literary publicist, an agent, an acquisitions editor, and a ghostwriter. Kathleen Schmidt has worked over the years on 50 New York Times bestsellers. She is the founder and CEO of Kathleen Schmidt Public Relations, and she has a Substack newsletter that's very popular called Publishing Confidential. It's an excellent resource wherein she shares her wealth of insider knowledge 
and makes efforts to demystify the book business. Once again, it is called Publishing Confidential. So here I am back in August talking with Kathleen Schmidt about what ails the modern publishing industry. I kind of knew, you know, what advances were like at different levels, but I didn't know it so much from the agent side, how hard it was to make good money on the agent side. And I found it incredibly frustrating because I would find these projects that I thought were very viable in the marketplace, and I still do. But editors, you know, that's when I started noticing, you know, editors would just say no right off the bat. You know, not for us, not for our list, and not really give a reason why. And it was very discouraging and disheartening to me to kind of look at the industry through that lens uh, and which 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 I should say is maybe closer to the author's lens. You're like one is. step closer to the author. Wait till you get down to the author's lens. <laughs> it gets really depressing. <laughs> I know. I know that now. And yeah. I you know, that's why I think the agenting experience for me was really important. All right. That was Kathleen Schmidt in an episode called Why the Publishing Industry is Broken the number two most downloaded Kraftwerk episode of the year. So we are now at number one, the number one most popular Kraftwerk episode of the year is an episode called Literary Agents 101. Once again, my guest is Carly Waters, herself a literary agent. And in this episode, she tells us what we need to know about literary agents, who they are, how they work, what to do, what not to do, all of it. This episode aired back in April of 2023. Here I am talking once again with Carly Waters. What are some do's and don'ts <laughs> in terms of like how to approach? I mean, writers are tend to be kind people, I think, in general, and tend to be awkward. So let's just assume it's going to be slightly awkward. But what are some ways to maybe help your cause or hurt your cause? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's such a good question. I mean, number one, if you were a writer, you would have, again, researched everybody going to the conference and presumably thought, hey, Carly Waters is a fit for me. Therefore, I know maybe a little bit about her list or I've read a client's book or listened to her podcast or heard around other people, right? So um, there should be some kind of understanding going into it. So if you know a little bit about me and, you know, kind of what I'm interested in and you think that we'd be a fit, that's a really great start, you know? I think a lot of writers think that these query letters or, you know, being in the top, you know, percentile of, you know, authors that end up getting an agent has to be special in some way but it's really just like following the rules querying people that are aligned with your your taste and so if you were again to find me at the conference you know you might find me during the pitch sessions or you might find me you know after a panel you might find me at the happy hour bar at four o'clock you know wherever you find me you know come up to me um and really i do want to hear about your book i want to hear your elevator pitch and so knowing how to describe your book in that sense is so important i think a lot of writers want to talk about you know, themes or how a book is going to make somebody feel or, you know, they want to kind of really get into detail about the synopsis of the book. But really what I want to know is, is the hook, right? The, what's the character, you know, what's their journey, but more like what's the stakes for this journey? What conflicts is this character getting into? All right, there we have it. Literary Agents 101 with Carly Waters, the most downloaded craft work episode of 2023 here on The Other People Show. Once again, all of these episodes are available in the feed, so if you want to listen to any or all of them, you can do that. The full conversations are there for you to enjoy at your leisure. So, having done that, it is now time to move on to the best or the most downloaded author interviews of the year. And again, because I do so many of these, I'm going to share the top 15 most downloaded author interviews of 2023. In today's episode, we'll be covering number 15 through number 11. And once again, the rest of the countdown will unfold 
in the days to come in a special series of episodes. After which, on New Year's Eve, I'm going to reveal my favorite reads of the year. So get ready for that. All right, so here we go with the best or the most popular, the most downloaded author interviews of 2023. Coming in at number 15 is episode 822, my conversation with Madeline Lucas, author of the debut novel Thirst for Salt, available from Tin House. Madeline Lucas is a senior editor of Noon Literary Journal and an instructor in the undergraduate and graduate writing programs at Columbia University. Here we are in conversation in episode 822, which first aired on March 19th, 2023. This is Madeline Lucas. One of the things that you've been talking about as you've talked about this book, I'm sure, is this age gap. There's an 18 year age difference between the narrator and Jude. And yet, there's nothing predatory mm-hmm. about the relationship. There may be you know, power imbalance in terms of his age and experience, mm-hmm. but it's not something that you're depi- It's not something that rises to the level of uh, predatory or abusive or anything mm-hmm. like that. Like this is a love affair on relatively stable ground, right? They're both mm-hmm. into it. <laughs> yeah, that was really important to me, and. You know, something I'm glad to have the opportunity to say is that when this book went out on submission, there were some editors who expressed disappointment that it wasn't a, quote, Me Too novel. And I found that really problematic because it seemed like there was this desire to co-opt what I felt was like a really important political moment as a way to sell books and make them more marketable. But I also had an issue with this idea that there was no place for a story about a woman in a relationship with an older man that wasn't predatory or where she wasn't framed as a victim. And so even though there is a power imbalance between them, I really wanted to show that she also has agency and that there's a sense to a certain degree of wanting to be equals or feeling like equals when they're in the middle of that relationship. Okay, that was Madeline Lucas. Episode 822, the 15th most downloaded episode of 2023. Once again, Madeline's debut novel is called Thirst for Salt. It is available from Tin House. So on to number 14, the 14th most downloaded episode of 2023 is episode 847, my conversation with Tess Gunty, author of the debut novel, The Rabbit Hutch, now available in trade paperback from Vintage. The Rabbit Hutch won the National Book Award for Fiction in 2022. So a pretty special debut. And I had a great conversation with Tess, who I should mention hails from the state of Indiana, as do I. My conversation with Tess Gunty first aired back on June 28th, and here we are in conversation in episode 847. And I read that when you were in Prospect Park melting (laughs) in the heat with your notebook, uh, you know, in this like desperate attempt to escape technology, (laughs) that you you were kind of, you know, the way that these characters came to you was with their most eccentric qualities. That was what you had to begin with. And then the process of writing the novel over five years was to sort of retrofit them yeah, in a way with qualities and life experiences and relationships that would justify these eccentricities and make them make sense for the reader, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think it was, I wanted to make these qualities feel um, not like explained, because I don't think, you know, all of us can can be explained or by, you know, the quotient of all of our experiences. But I did want it to feel like, oh, this is inevitable. This is a natural trajectory for this character. And yeah, I mean, I think I'm drawn to eccentricities in in people that I meet as well. I feel like that's when you start to really get to know 
someone is the qualities, the behaviors that they they haven't assimilated, like they haven't tried to manipulate into con- conformity, or that they can't manipulate into conformity, or and so. I think that's partly why I'm so drawn to eccentricities and people, but also I think I, I did want this novel to have a kind of a slightly unreal sort of shimmer to it and giving everyone these kinds of bizarre behaviors and creating a world in which the bizarre phenomena was, was commonplace helped me achieve a kind of, um, yeah, more kind of folkloric distance. Okay. That was Tess Gunty, author of the debut novel, The Rabbit Hutch, winner of the 2022 National Book Award for Fiction. We were in conversation in episode 847, and it is the 14th most downloaded episode of 2023. Which then brings us to number 13, and my conversation with Isabella Hamad in episode 835. Isabella is the author of the novel Enter Ghost, available from Grove Press. And it's a book that is timely now in ways that feel poignant, extra poignant in light of what has been unfolding in the Middle East and Israel and Gaza. So Enter Ghost, for those of you who are not familiar with the book, takes place in Israel and is very much about the difficult history of the region and the plight of the Palestinian people. Here I am, back in May of this year, talking with Isabella Hamad. So Palestinians are, are, you know, they often, they all have different legal statuses, different, uh, different paperwork, different levels of freedom of movement. So part of the book I was trying to, it's almost like a sort of fantasy to put on a play with all of these elements from Palestinian society, including the diaspora, although I, I didn't include Gaza, although I kind of referenced the absence of Gaza in the production because it wouldn't be really realistic to have somebody from Gaza in a play if I wanted it within within the, the boundaries of historical Palestine. Uh, as a kind of... Uh, wait, wait, may I interrupt you? May yeah, I, and the reason for that is that travel between Gaza and the West Bank is... Is that why? You would not have somebody from Gaza in the play? No, basically, Gaza, Gaza and Palestinians are, are stuck in Gaza. If they, if they manage to get... Uh, 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 visa or kind of approval which is rare and very very difficult to get hold of to get out of gaza they will go to jerusalem to the to embassies for example but more or less gazans are stuck in gaza yeah okay there we have isabella hamad and her novel once again is called enter ghost available from grove press an excellent novel and that conversation episode 835 is the 13th most downloaded episode of 2023. So we are now at number 12. The 12th most downloaded episode of the year is episode 831. My conversation with author Claire Dieterer. Her latest book is called Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma. It is available from Knopf, Perhaps you've heard of it. It was a big book this past year, and I had a great conversation with Claire. She is a book critic, an essayist, and a reporter, and a longtime contributor to the New York Times, as well as other publications. We had a very fascinating conversation about monsters back in April. So here is a clip from my conversation with Claire Dieterer in episode 831. And I thought something that you say early in the book uh, was particularly interesting, and it has to do with you at the outset of this process reaching out to one of your old college instructors. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. you sort of realize, maybe after the fact, I don't know how quickly you noted this to yourself, that your first instinct when you were delving into this subject matter was to reach out to a white male quote-unquote expert. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, But when you did that, I think the fact that you you found that there really wasn't much precedent for deep dive investigations into this subject matter, there was not like an authority on this stuff. Right, yeah. 
And I, I mean, there is there people have certainly written about this and thought about the separate, you know, what's sometimes called the biographical fallacy. You know, the I, the the word fallacy is the clue that that particular point of view thinks that we shouldn't uh, let the biography imbue our perception of the work of art or the idea of separating the art from the artist. There's certainly been people who have written about this. But it's not it's it's not kind of a part of aesthetics that's hugely talked about. And when I found that it was talked about, what I found was that there was this word should. There was very often this idea of how you were supposed to respond to the art. And that seemed not useful to me. All right. That was Claire Dieterer, episode 831, the 12th most downloaded episode of 2023. Claire's book, once again, is called Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma. It is available from Knopf. And so now, where are we? We're at 11. We've taken it to 11. The 11th most downloaded episode of 2023 is episode 841, my conversation with Jasmine Iolani Hakes, author of the debut novel Hula, available from Harper Via. Jasmine Iolani Hakes is a native of Hilo, Hawaii, and Hula is very much a novel that addresses the role that hula dancing plays in Hawaiian culture. Jasmine herself was a hula dancer. She worked all throughout college as a professional luau dancer. And we had a great conversation back in June about all of the above and more. So here we go with number 11, my conversation with Jasmine Iolani Hakes in episode 841. And I think so many tourists, like their context for a hula dance is at a hotel with like the tiki torches burning and the waves in the background and everyone feeling they're having a special moment. And I can't help but think like, wow, these luau dancers in their heads are probably like, Losers. (laughs) Losers. <laughs> well, I mean, and I think I think that's another aspect of why I wrote what I wrote and how that story came to be. I, you know, when I first started dancing hula, I danced for a very traditional, very beloved halal that they're not performative at all, or they weren't at that time. Now they've evolved into, they do a lot of education and and they have a foundation and uh, it's a lot of cultural work and preservation. But at that time, I was taught in the way that they had been taught and their mothers had been taught and all the way down the line of, we pass on these chants, we pass on these ways, we pass on these these uh, certain traditions because that's the only way they're going to survive. All right, folks, there we have it. That was Jasmine Iolani Hakes, author of the debut novel Hula, available from Harper Via. Episode 841, coming in at number 11 for 2023. So that does it for today's episode, the first installment in my best of 2023 series. Next up will be part two, and I'm going to be breaking down numbers 10 through six in my author interview countdown. And then following that, I will do the top five in its own episode. So it's very exciting. You'll have to stay tuned as I roll out the top 15 most downloaded author interviews of the year. And once again, on New Year's Eve, I will be rounding things out and bringing 2023 officially to a close by sharing my personal favorite books of the year. So there is a lot going on here on the Other People podcast over the holidays to help keep you company as you travel, as you deal with family, as you return items at the mall. If people still do that, I don't even know. 
or as you sit in your car or on an airplane, or maybe you're at the beach. Maybe you're one of the lucky ones. Wherever you are, I hope all is well. Happy holidays to you. Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. The show will be back soon with more Best of 2023 fun. So 